The University of Utah Relationship Decisions Lab is seeking couples who are currently monogamous but who are considering opening up their relationship to participate in a research survey. You can find more information during the ad break in today's episode, or you can go to relationshipdecisions.org slash open dash relationships. This episode is brought to you by Audible. For a 30-day free trial, one free audiobook, and to support our show, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about how to build trust in a relationship. There are a lot of different kinds of trust. If you were to just look up a definition of trust, that word is used in things like investing and in sociology and technology, like can we trust our smartphones, things like that. But what we're talking about in this episode is specifically trust in a relationship mostly in romantic relationships, but just I think this also applies more generally of trust between two people in a relationship. So let's start off with kind well, of hang defining on, this Hang here. on, though, because you wanted to do this because you said that this is what, like the number three most Googled search term? Yeah, there was something a, an, like that. An article trust? That, an article that came out. Trust. An article came out recently <laughs> that was the top 10 Google searches about relationships in 2017. And one of them, and I don't remember exactly now if it was number three or two, it was one of the top ones was how to build trust in a relationship, specifically those Mm. words. And Mm. I was like, you know, that's something we talk about a lot about honesty and trust and that trust is this important foundation, especially if you're going to do anything that's non-traditional. And well, speaking of non-traditional, wasn't non-traditional relationships also on that list, the the search terms list? Yeah, in the list of top 10, two of them had to do with polyamory. No, one was just times. like, what is polyamory? <laughs> and another one was um, something about open like relationships. Like how to open your relationship? Yeah, mm, something like yeah. that. Yeah, sounds about right. Sounds about yeah. right. So anyway, the fact that we're in two of the top 10 you know, questions is, is a lot of what we talk about on this, I think is a good indication that this is becoming a more and more relevant topic to yeah, a lot more people, that yeah. more people are at least aware of it and thinking about it, whether or not they actually end up doing it themselves. At least there's more people out there getting confused by it, you know? (laughs) Well, yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the, you know, there's some good answers online to those questions. And then there's some kind of shitty ones. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can contribute to there being some more good answers out there. So with that, can God we talk willing. about trust? What is yes, it? What is, what is it? Okay. The kind so, of trust we're talking about here. The kind of trust that we're talking about. Uh, uh, gosh, I mean, I feel like that's a hard one to define if I'm just trying to think of off the top of my brain right. how to define trust. Um, so trust is, you know, it's it's part of a relationship between two people where the trustor, the person mm-hmm. who's doing the trusting, decides to believe that the other person or the trustee is going to do what they say, and it's going to act with benevolence toward the trust door. Mm-hmm. Um, that all sounds like really fancy smancy, more fancy smancy than I think it should. Um, <laughs> basically, like when I'm looking at you as this other person who's in this human relationship with me, mm-hmm. I believe that the things that you say are are true, and that you're speaking and acting with integrity, and also that you are going to be kind to me, and that you're also going to treat me with also my best interests in mind. Or, at, like or at the very least with fairness. With fairness, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And yeah. there's a Wikipedia definition too. Can I go yeah, on what's that? that? Yeah, yeah what's go that? for it. Yeah, so in sociology and psychology, the degree to which one party trusts another is a measure of belief in the honesty, fairness, or benevolence of another party. The term confidence is more appropriate for a belief in the competence of the other party. A failure in trust may be forgiven more easily if it is interpreted as a failure of competence rather than a lack of benevolence or honesty. 
Mm. So I think that's a really interesting distinction to make. And I was trying to think yeah. of like, what does this look like in mm-hmm. real life? Um, and maybe the two of you can help me think of this because I'm trying to think about like, okay, so what's the difference between me uh, not thinking that someone's going to come through because I don't think they're an honest person or that they're a good person versus me not thinking someone's someone's going to go through with something because I just don't think that they're not that they're competent or well, that they can do hmm. what I'm asking them to do. This this isn't about that though. This is about when they don't do the thing they said they were going to do. I see. Is why do you think they did it? And I think a good example of this could be if we use something just very small. Mm-hmm. This could be the example of uh, you know, say the three of us are talking about something and I'm like, okay, I will get this multi-amory thing done by tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then I don't. And then you don't. That if you feel like, yeah, okay, Jace was bad with time management and he lacked the competence mm. to, to get that thing done, I can more easily forgive that than mm-hmm. if it's like he said he was going to do it and then was like, fuck that. Like, I don't mm. actually have or to do it. Or if I think it. like, oh, he was just saying that to like look good or to look like he could handle yeah. like do something that he couldn't actually do right like, that's interesting <clears throat> yeah so i think that's yeah. that's an example i mean i feel like in even the thing that this makes me think of when it comes to relationships especially more of a traditional way of looking at like fidelity in relationships is i think that a common argument that's actually used to justify infidelity is this kind of argument of like well I was in the moment and I like couldn't resist my like urges or feelings that I was having toward this person who I happened to get like snowed into this hotel with on a work trip or do you know what I mean? Like that where it's not that I intentionally went out and did this, but they're like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Like, like I lack the willpower. The I lack the willpower the, to exactly. resist the external circumstances. And I think that is such a tempting explanation to use because I do think it makes it if you believe it, hmm. makes it more easy to forgive that person, at least according to what this is saying about the the research that's been done about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, do you try to give like a person the benefit of the doubt who you have a relationship with just simply because, hey, like they're a loved one or they're a person with whom you have a history? Or does mm-hmm. that kind of go out the window when trust is involved? Well, or when trust is betrayed more yeah. Moreover, can I can I get sort of super technical about it for a second? Sure. So that, yeah. Let's go. Let's go nerdy for a second, then we'll talk about kind of more real world applications. So, basically, in in reading about this, I thought it was really cool that that trust essentially is an imperfect system that we just decide to use because it's easier than the alternative. And what that means is the alternative being. I have to prepare for every single possibility of anything that anyone else might do Mm -hmm. to the point that that's just overwhelming. I can't spend all of my time thinking about every possible outcome of what you might do. Planning for that and and planning for all those. Exactly. Mm. So instead, we choose trust. And there are other things like this, but for trust specifically, I choose instead of spending all my mental energy on that, I'm just going to, on faith, with no, like, I don't have any way of guaranteeing it. I will trust that you're going to do the things you're going to say you're doing. You're going to be honest with me Mm. and fair with me and all of that. So this, I'm kind of jumping ahead into our next category a little bit here, but this has been shown, willingness to trust has been shown um, in a lot of different studies to be very closely linked with well-being, Hmm. with um, reported well-being and and levels of life satisfaction, which is something we kind of talked a while ago on our episode about... um, positive psychology well I, I hang on so yeah let yeah, me yeah, let ahead. me argue this a little mm-hmm, bit do mm-hmm. you think there might be a little bit of circular reasoning there because do you think that you could argue that maybe somebody who already has better well-being or more life satisfaction because they have not experienced a lot of betrayals for mm-hmm. instance or maybe they didn't experience like a huge amount of devastated trust early on that means they're more likely to to be willing to trust people it's possible. Mm. Versus it's like if you think of somebody who has experienced a lot of egregious breaches of trust over the course of their life, that would probably affect their satisfaction in their life and in their relationships in general. And mm-hmm. then that's tied to them not wanting to trust other people. So I'm just wondering of like if there's kind of a causation correlation mix up. Well, with, that. with it's like yeah. a nature versus nurture question that right there. Too also. Well, right. And and all of this is is saying that this isn't 
a causation, like none of, no psychological research really does that. Mm -hmm. It's all correlation, right? It's mm -hmm. saying that they've shown that in, if you map out people's personality traits, you know, and this is, this, this was in a study of like 129 different personality traits of which willingness to trust was one of them. Mm -hmm. And that they found that that among just like a few others were the ones that had the highest correlation with your self-reported well-being with how, how not even happy, but well-being, right? Feeling like you have a sense of purpose and that you're generally satisfied with your life. You feel like you have some control over your life, things like that. Um, and this, the reason why this comes up in those terms is because it is something that's dealt with a lot in uh, in psychology and in therapy in dealing with incidences of, you know, uh, abuse or betrayal or things where that happening in your life, whether it was something very early on with your parents or something that's happened later on with a partner or a coworker or, you know, who knows what, like why those events can be so damaging is because they hurt our ability to trust other people. Mm -hmm. Just in general for the rest of our lives? Well, if we don't do anything about it, mm -hmm. right? That I mean, all of this with all, as we talked about in the positive psychology episode, like there are actually very few things about ourselves that are permanent, set in yeah, stone, yeah. right? So um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of why this, I think, is worth talking about. And I also think it's why it comes up in all these Google searches. Because mm -hmm. people are being like, I realize that I would be happier in this relationship if I could trust my partner. Mm. Or if they trusted me. Right. How do we get to that? Right, right. So apparently in psychology, trust is shown to start really early on in childhood, where we have these first experiences of trust being established or violated by our caretakers. And then our willingness to trust is often shaped by that, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Like if you have a, <laughs> if you're, I don't know, you, it, it, every single day you get fed at five or something. <laughs> this is like a pet. Uh -huh. but seriously, like every single day you get uh -huh. fed at five. And then all of a sudden, like your mother, you know, waits until 530 or something. <laughs> like you feel like your trust has been violated at that moment or you know, your mom, when you cry, always brings a, a toy and then doesn't do that one time. Like, do you feel your trust is violated? Like, is it something like that? Or well, I think is that's it a, like that's a, a bigger... Tiny little yes, thing. Yes, yes, but, yes, but those still have an but, effect, right? Exactly. Because just, cause you, as a baby, you don't have your adult logical mind exactly. to, mm -hmm. to talk that away or to realize that's not a big deal, right? You have a baby brain. Yeah, you yeah, also everything don't is know so big when it's five o'clock. I guess that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, like dogs and cats, like know what the fuck is what yeah, the fuck time it is, true. and they're like, yeah. okay, it's seven. You need to feed me you now. Need to feed me now. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this so what I was trying to get to actually was that these are very little things, but it's a good example of that our trust is going to be broken by our parents or our caretakers, whoever that is. Like regardless of their intention. Right, it's gonna happen. They're gonna say, oh yeah, I'll get you that toy and then they end up not being able to afford it. Or they say, oh, I'll yeah. be home at this time and we can play and then an emergency comes up, they can't do it. Like even with the best of intentions, there's gonna be some betrayals of trust. Mm. The question is just how bad is it right, right. like how, how egregious is this sin yeah. exactly um yeah. you know and this can be you know everything from from very very heavy things you know really traumatic things for the for the child for you as that child two things like we were saying that are a little bit more mundane mm -hmm. you know this is the whole question about santa claus mm, of like right. are you oh. teaching your children that they can't trust people by telling them that santa's by, real by lying to them about santa knowing that someday they're going to find out you lied to them and not only that you lied to them once but that you continually lied to them mm. for years interesting oh shit <laughs> Are there some strong arguments against Santa on yeah, the, on, I'm I just, I mean, on, the on like the psychological standpoint? I, I've heard people talk about it, but I've never like looked into if there's any real research huh. on that. Interesting. Yeah. I but did I, have a friend who recently told me that her <laughs> that her sister just like lost her shit entirely oh. when she found out Santa Claus wasn't real, oh. and like oh. ran into the bedroom and slammed the door oh. and was like, "You lied to me for years." <sighs> And it was really bad. So exactly. that's probably I mean, that a traumatic, traumatic event like, that they'll remember forever. Yeah, uh, absolutely. At least traumatic on a child level, right? Well, yeah. yeah. But that's the time when we're that's learning a big deal. what trust is. That's true. Right? That's true. Eek.
And I could see I could see someone making an argument on the other side, though, of saying, well, we want to expose our kids to a certain amount of this to teach them to not be gullible, Hmm. like to Hmm. teach them that, like, not everyone's going to tell you the truth all the time. Hmm. But, you know, I don't know. I again, I don't know what research there is to back that up. Hmm. So, well, what about like families that the parents are together for a while and then they get divorced? Like, does that have a certain level of trust built in and then does that mean that like those kids are forever scarred well okay so that's what i would think i mean and i think that this is much more relatable for us to think about because heaven knows like all three of us are uh you know children of parents not being together Mm -hmm. you know either divorcing or not being present in various different ways and i think a lot of people of our generation experience that as well um but apparently studies have shown that uh people who grew up in divorced families uh, apparently don't show any greater distrust of their partners or of their friends than people who grew up with their parents still together. Mm -hmm. Um, It seems like, uh, you know, the likelihood of you being willing to trust or unwilling to trust uh, is about the same, even if your parents divorced when you were growing up. Right. That it seems like other factors are more important to that. Which is good news. Mm-hmm. I was like, whew, okay, all right. <laughs> At least I don't have to worry so much We're not all just one. like, We're not oh all doomed God. in that regard. We don't trust anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, let's let's start getting into to understanding trust on kind of a more practical level, like how it actually plays out in our lives. Yeah, so there's these four states of trust, which Dr. Ricky Robbins wrote about, um, and they include perfect trust, damaged trust, devastated trust and restored trust so the first one is going to be perfect trust um and that's the thing that's your baby trust your baby that you're born with it <laughs> you, you baby trust i really just took this one so that i could say baby so you trust, say baby trust. you're born with it <laughs> as a baby um and then you never get that back ever again so you have like perfect skin you have uh, <laughs> everyone around See, you puts up with your bullshit like your it's basically the things that you're born with among as a the baby, things that you're born with and then never get back again <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah it's so one trust. of them is this perfect trust mm-hmm. um and then the next one is damaged trust so that's caused by a very like minor breach of trust um such as an omission of a detail or like a early caught lie. Hmm. Um, But these little things can over time severely damage trust and then move into the next form, which is... Uh, I'm sorry, I just need to talk about an an early caught lie. That just sounds like so... Like a it what? Just, that's, the name of, that's the name of a soap opera right there. An early, the early caught, caught, caught lie. lie. A it's soap like, opera by honest, Jace Lindgren. <laughs> <laughs> Except to be honest, an early caught lie would be not a very interesting soap opera. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Those are more. I mean, it makes me think of things like uh, in our uh, in a lot of our romantic comedies and stuff. There will be some lie or omission of a detail that gets set up early on. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, yeah, I do totally work for the rebellion. Yes. Right. Like. <laughs> That's not a not a romantic comedy, but if we're talking about Star Wars, right? That like, yeah, I'm totally that. And then, you know, us as the audience no, are I waiting own, for, yeah, you know, how long is this till this gets found out? Mm-hmm. And it's going to be really bad because now all of a sudden the trust that they had is betrayed. Um, but this early caught lie thing is interesting um, because if you think about that, I've I've heard this as an explanation for why humans blush, actually. Oh, is to make it easier for us to be to, caught in our lives. Exactly. That, huh. that what? That's crazy. Blushing and doing other kinds of deception leakage is the term in Weird. technically. That's, is it sounds something gross. That, that, yeah. <laughs> you want to take care of that. Yeah. Something that gives us away when we're lying. You would think, like, why would we evolve to have that, right? Like, mm-hmm. getting caught in a lie seems like a bad thing. Wouldn't we evolve to be more sociopaths and just able to lie without any problem? But... It's because if you're, again, if you're thinking about sort of tribal humans, Mm -hmm. right? If you don't get caught in a lie for a long time and then you do, how badly betrayed everybody feels by that could Mm. very well lead you to be kicked out Mm. of the society and probably die. Whereas on the other hand, if you tell a lie and you get caught right away because you're a bad liar, that that actually is more survivable because people actually trust you more in the long run interesting that's really interesting to think about yeah Yeah. 
Well, so that leads into the next one, which is the devastated trust, which this is distinguished by it could be a major deception. Um, it can be something that you've been keeping secret for a very long time yeah, like as well, about. like we're talking about, like maybe yeah. these smaller things uh, that aren't found out right away that are just kept or they build up or there's multiple small things that are kept secret for a very long time and then they come to light. Um, and so it seems like most of the literature on this really recommends that if you suspect that your partner has done something that is a breach of trust, it's better to try to talk about it earlier rather than later. Mm -hmm. And this is very hard to do because of course, all of pretty much all of us are conflict averse. You know, yeah. nobody wants to rock the boat. No one wants to be confrontational. And I think especially we fear like, if I confront my partner on something and there's truly nothing, then I look like mm -hmm. the weirdo or right. the paranoid one or whatever. Um, but the thing is that bear in mind that like the more time goes on, the more there's the likelihood of a bomb, a much bigger bomb going off much later on down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it's and it's so easy to put it off because whether you're the person who wants to come clean about a lie or you're the person who feels like ah, something doesn't seem right here, that in either way it's like, ah, but I don't want to cause an argument or, I don't yeah right I don't want to mess things up well, can, ironically that you might that might be exactly the thing that does mess it up so can I talk about there's this quote here that mm -hmm. Dr. Ricky Robbins also yeah. says yeah. they say uh, conversely if you betray your partner either reveal it at the time or else take a vow of eternal silence sharing a betrayal farther down the road devastates trust now I don't know is this the same person or is this someone different it's a JC? different one yeah yeah because there is Whoa. someone you were talking about who, like a some psychologist who mm -hmm. actually takes the stance of like if you cheated on your partner and never told like, them don't say don't anything? tell them right that it's basically Which is super controversial and I'm, I'm also not entirely sure how yeah. I feel about that but I get yeah. like by this reasoning being like it's going to cause much more damage because of the fact that you've held on to it this long mm. Yeah, so, so this person, Dr. Ricky Robbins, who, who wrote a lot of these things that were taking these four uh, types of trust or these four stages of trust. She calls them four stages of trust. We've ch changed that to four uh, states of trust because mm -hmm. it's not like they necessarily go linearly in mm -hmm. stages. Um, but uh, she actually died in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, this shit. this other psychologist who, I'm sorry, I don't remember her mm. name, um, who specifically counsels you know couples um that her stance and this is something that i heard in an interview with her more recently so i know it's not the same person mm. uh that it is that it's that her stance specifically is if you cheated in a relationship and then decided to end that other you know mm. infidelitous relationship and to mm -hmm. go back to being monogamous in your relationship and they haven't found out that you should just keep it secret forever wow. because Jesus. that's the kinder thing to do to them. And wow. that her argument is the reason why we feel this need to come clean about something in the past like that is not because like we tell ourselves it's like, oh, they deserve to know or something. Her argument is um, that you're actually it's selfish only exactly. It's selfish that yeah. you're mm -hmm. only doing that to try to assuage some sort of feeling of guilt that you have, but that by doing it, you're actually hurting not only your relationship, but also the other person. But it's very controversial. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. No, it reminds me of, I had a former partner who um, used to have like lots and lots of issues with being in monogamous relationships in his past, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that like he cheated all the time. And he never, you know, he never came clean. Like there had been times he'd been caught, but he never proactively came clean and that his justification in his mind was something along those lines was like the guilt that I feel and I have to carry around. Like that's kind of the trade off. Like that's my punishment essentially is that I carry that, mm -hmm. you know? And again, it's the same thing where it's like, I kind of get it, but that's also kind of shitty. And you know, it, it feels kind of related to that. Yeah. I mean, I have a very good friend who's cheated on her partner a few times quite a few times and that is the question of like but never come clean with it mm -hmm. and i always wonder that like well should she tell him it would be would it be the kinder thing to do well that I so no that does bring up a good distinction though just to further talk about this subject so this again this psychologist who i was hearing about and who was talking in this interview was saying that <clears throat> in her example saying like you just need to vow to keep that secret forever was specifically in the circumstances that you've now stopped doing it 
Mm. So right, I guess that does make a difference. It's a different thing if this is an ongoing. But what if thing. you do it again? Well, that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna be then it's gonna be different, yeah. right? Then I feel it's like different considerations. Yeah, that this if this is something that is a repeating behavior or that you're pretty yeah. sure that you're going to do again if you're honest with yourself, then it's a little different story. Then then I don't think her argument is still keep that secret. It's like, no, now you have to deal with it because mm. you're not able to be yeah, in to, this relationship. Yeah, this is more integrity. When something's already happened and you've ended it for whatever yeah, reason. It's like, right? Eek. That, I did the bad yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's interesting, and and uh, in this other article though that where I where we pulled this quote from, uh, Dr. Robbins gives various examples of um, clients of hers who've come in with these sorts of things where, you know, uh, a husband admits to his wife, you know, twenty years later that he had an affair wow. sometime way back then. He just needed to get it off his chest and said that their relationship never recovered from it. Mm, that yeah. she's I've like, definitely you could, seen that exactly. happen a number of times. And it's really sad because I've known friends where it's that same thing. They, they cheated one time yeah. 10 years ago and they told their partner. And the really sad thing is that what came back from the other side was like, oh, well, I feel like the past 10 years have been a lie. Exactly. When when maybe Jeez. it's like technically no, not the case. Like he cheated once and then after that it was that, you know, but... But I think it's yeah, more I don't this... Know, it's, I feel really uncomfortable right now because I can't tell which side I'm arguing <laughs> for. <laughs> I <know. laughs> well, I think this, this whole thing about a lie getting caught earlier being easier to forgive mm. is it's not... It's not that the fact that this happened 10 years ago makes the thing you did worse but it makes the idea that I could go that long not figuring it out mm. and you never telling me, the fact that you have that ability and that I don't have that ability to figure it out, that's the problem. Yeah, that's that's uh, painful. Right, because that's what, again, that, to go back to our definition of trust, it's that. It's that I'm not going to put in the effort to think about all the things you might do because I'm going to choose to trust that you're just going to do what you say you're going to do. Hmm. And so yeah. when you find out like, oh God, for the last 10 years, that hasn't been true and I haven't known about it, it just throws into doubt that whole system that's let you get by this long. Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, anyway, we'll let, we'll let you continue to debate that <laughs> further. It's a, it's a tough yeah. one. Yeah. It really is. It really is. I, actually, I did want to give like a counterexample that couples I do know who have gotten past some kind of infidelity, it is often either found out about or admitted much earlier yeah, on. Yeah, that, that's true. That like that's true. the mm. next day or like coming home from the business trip mm. or or even if it's just something like I kissed another person, like I have to tell you I'm sorry, I, it was stupid, right? That mm. kind of thing that while it still can suck. Breach of trust, and, yeah. And damage that trust for a while. I generally feel like I hear that example more often in relationships that do recover that do and rebuild trust. back from it, yeah. Mm. Which That's brings us point. to our next uh, state of trust, which is restoring trust. So restoring trust takes time and it takes work from both parties, both from the person needing to figure out how to give trust again, how to have trust again, and from the person who needs to show that they deserve it, mm -hmm. show that they earn it. Unfortunately, the way trust works is it's asymmetrical. It can take a long time to build and can be destroyed really quickly. Yeah. Mm. So it's it's a tough thing, and and part of this is also um, kind of realizing that if someone is untrustworthy, that it's not just like overnight they're going to change that either. Mm -hmm. Which is something we've talked about kind of in more vague terms in the past on this show when people are moving towards some kind of non monogamy after infidelity. Yes that that comes up of like okay maybe this is a better fit but we have this trust problem to deal with first because unfortunately it got to the point where you know where that happened and that trust was damaged yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i think i think the important here is that is that it takes both sides mm -hmm. that because what i often see people struggle with so much is either one person thinking like well, this person is just like gonna have to trust me again. Like they just need to let it go and they just need to trust me again um, without right. me putting a lot of emphasis on like trying to change my behavior or make any kind of intentional effort. And then I also see people on the other side being like, well, like they need to prove to me every single day, every single minute that I can trust them again. And like, I don't have to give any trust until I've seen, you know, a whole year's worth of proof that I can <laughs> trust them. And both of those Jeez. attitudes are 
really problematic. Destructive, and, yeah. And if not destructive, they're just not going to get you moving right. forward, you know. Can mm-hmm. I talk about the forwarding trust thing? Sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we didn't even put that in our notes. Yeah, yeah. with Jason and I, and this was like a number of years ago, um, you know, when we had a falling out in our relationship that, you know, the thing that kind of got us to move forward is that like I in that particular situation needed to be like conscious of my behavior and acknowledging my behavior in the past and acknowledging steps that I was going to take to change that in the future. But then what I had to ask from him also was like, I need you to forward me a little bit of trust. Like I need a little Mm -hmm. bit of an advance payment. It's, you know, not 100%, not never worrying about it and not being a doormat or whatever, but it is going to require at least a little bit of that advance payment of trust, essentially, in order for us to actually move forward. Yeah, that's yeah. a good way yeah. to put it. Yeah. So before we get a little bit more into some techniques for building trust and restoring trust, we want to take a quick moment to talk about how you can support our show and to help us to keep doing this. Uh, it's we're, we're well on our way into 20... 18, also known as Whoa. Collaborate Teen. According to the McElroys. According to the McElroys. Collaborate Teen. <laughs> we're better together. Not just like... Stronger together. We're stronger we're together. Stronger, yeah. together. We're stronger yeah. together. So it's Collaborate Teen, and we would love you to collaborate <laughs> with us. <laughs> 20 great teen. I thought that was what it was. Well, is that too? It's both. It's both, yeah. 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 Um, and the best way for you to support our show and to help us to keep doing this and to help grow this and to get more resources out there, which we love you know, providing for free for people who want to listen to our podcast, is to support us on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash multiamory, you can choose to pledge a certain amount of money every month and join our private Facebook community at the $5 level. At the $7 level, you get ad-free episodes that also sometimes have bonus content at the end of those. At the $9 level, we have a monthly video discussion group. And at the $15 level, you're our best friend. Uh, no, but seriously, <laughs> we send you seriously, a personalized <laughs> thank you video, um, and we also just really appreciate that so much. Our Patreon community is amazing, and we love them so much. The patrons are the ones who help shape this show and help determine that the direction it's it's going in as well. Mm-hmm. So if you get something out of this show and you're not already, join us at patreon.com slash multiamory. 20 collaborate collaborate team so you're trying to collaborate are you trying team. to force these two <laughs> collaborate yes. team collaborate collaborate that's, team that's what it is it's so much better than 20 suck it 17 yeah yeah, yeah. hey yeah, man 2017 is when my book came out yeah yeah, yeah. that was the <laughs> yeah, only good thing cares? that and the nintendo switch were the only good things mm. about 2017 mm. yeah mm. it's pretty good though yeah so besides all that <laughs> stuff you should write us a review if you haven't already you probably have but if you haven't write us a review we would so appreciate it um on probably mostly itunes but also what's the other one stitcher yes. stitcher yes itunes and yeah, stitcher sti- are the places you can write reviews itunes is yeah, the hot iTunes- place to do it though that's where all the cool kids do it's it it's so hot right yeah. now but yeah. Um, besides those two, yeah, those are the places that you can write us a review and we would really appreciate it because it would help us get higher in search results and that is incredibly important. What? (laughs) You're giggling through this and it makes it sound so disingenuous, even though I know that it is quite genuine. (laughs) God damn it, it's not. Please write us a review. Jace will cry, we will love it, and we Mm -hmm. will know that we are doing something good for this world. See, that's the great. Sad, you spoke your truth. World. You spoke your truth. Yeah. It's great. Okay. Um, so, another thing thanks. that you can do to support our show is you can try out Audible. Audible is our sponsor for this week's episode. So, um, Audible, Audible, you, Audible is a great audiobook database. You sign mm-hmm. up for a subscription, um, you get a credit every single month that can go towards an audiobook of your choice. Um, something I would highly recommend is a book that changed my life, which is a book called The Art of Nonconformity by Chris Gilbo. Mm. Um, and uh, that I book- I also listened to that audiobook. Yes, it's a good one. And yeah. that book was really instrumental in me uh, being able to start traveling and to put effort and energy into my own projects and the things that I wanted to do. Um, He doesn't talk about relationships in that book, but I feel like a lot of his philosophy around nonconformity and having the courage to uh, be a nonconformist would definitely apply to all y'all out there 
who are interested in having non-traditional and non-conforming relationships. So would definitely recommend that one. If you want to give it a try, you can go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. You'll get 30 days for free. You'll get a credit for a free audiobook, and a little bit comes back to us to help support this show. So again, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. Uh, And then also, we actually have something a little different from the normal today that's pretty exciting, and that is that there is a study going on right now that's part of the University of Utah Relationship Decisions Lab. Uh, And this is actually a pretty cool thing because the Relationship Decisions Lab, which you can find at relationshipdecisions.org, Uh, they publish all of their studies as PDFs on their website. So unlike a lot of the polyamory or just relationship studies out there that you have to pay these, you know, expensive subscriptions to like LexisNexis or these like academic academic journal places Mm -hmm. to be able to get them, that they actually just publish them there for real people like (laughs) you and I to be able to learn about them, which I I really appreciate. And I I wish that more research was done in this way. Mm -hmm. Uh, But right now they're doing a study that's the first of its kind in that they are looking for uh, people who are in monogamous relationships that are currently considering opening up their relationships, but haven't done it yet. And this Mm -hmm. could be people who are doing this for the first time or you were open or polyamorous in the past and have closed your relationship and are now just with one person but are are planning to or hoping to open it back up again in the future so if you yourself are someone who's considering doing this or you have friends or people in your local poly community who are considering opening up their relationship uh, this study will probably be going on for the next year or so so send them this link and the link for that is relationshipdecisions.org slash open dash relationships. And that's also at the beginning of the episode if you want to go back and check that. Uh, Anyway, I'm very excited about this. Yeah, it's amazing that like actual poly studies are happening now. I'm so glad. It's so it's, it's hasn't been there before and now here we are it's a new yeah. it's a new dawn it's a new age <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah and the relationship decisions lab doesn't focus specifically on non-monogamy they, it's all sorts of things about the reasons why people do the things they do in relationships and they've got some cool studies up there which i'd recommend checking out if you like that sort of thing uh but either way to participate in this one it's relationship org slash open dash relationships with an s at the end also uh to tempt you even further uh you'll be entered into a raffle for a 100 hundred dollar amazon gift card bonus which sounds awesome to me (laughs) uh yeah actually that you'll be uh, entered into a raffle to win a hundred dollar amazon gift card and if you also participate in their follow-up which will be two months later you get entered again for another draw nice so nice and what their sample size is they're studying a thousand they're trying to get a thousand people they're aiming to get a thousand couples i think to participate in this Mm -hmm. and this is better chances than the lottery and this is sort of an addendum study (laughs) yeah (laughs) this is an addendum study to their previous one that they did which had 800 non-monogamous couples and so this is now to look at people who are considering opening up to then try to correlate some of this data together right Uh, anyway pretty exciting go check that out and uh spread the word with people you know who are thinking about opening up their relationships great and with that let's get back into creating trust so we started getting to this a moment ago which is how do we know like when can we trust people like can trust be rebuilt with this Mm -hmm. person because we're just saying you know it takes effort from both sides but uh, you know there are times when either someone you know, maybe you shouldn't be trusted again uh, Mm -hmm. or where it's just, even if I would like to trust you, I just can't and I won't ever get there. Well, I think just to preview a little bit of Mm -hmm. what we'll get into later, the key here is the fact that trust is not this black and white. It's not uh, either I trust you or I don't, which a lot of people tend to talk about it in that way. Um, it is more more shades of gray in between there, ultimately. And especially when- How many shades would you say it is? I would say at least- 49. Oh. Um, Anyway, especially when it comes to this conversation around trust that's been broken and then needs to be rebuilt, that often it's not a case of like, 
we just switch the trust switch back on to right. on, you know, that it's it's a little bit different from that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that was just a little preview of later. Please go ahead. Yeah, so, well, something that I wanted to talk about was kind of how you evaluate if, uh, if a person is trustworthy enough to be worth building trust with them. And something that I have both read about and heard in a lot of pop psychology advice and things like that is is people will say things like trust your intuition like go with your Mm. gut you know if you feel like this person's trustworthy or not and i actually really dislike this advice um this i think that i think that intuition is it's such a Intuition isn't really a thing, I guess, is what I'm getting at, that that people can treat it like it's this magical thing that sort of knows some truth and like gives us a little bit of access to it. But it's really just a word to describe these feelings or kind of things in the back of our mind. And it could look different for different people. And while I think for one person, they might need someone to say, hey, you know what? I think you've got this going on in the back of your mind, trust that intuition. But I also think there's a lot of other people who will either stay in a destructive relationship because their intuition they think is telling them that it's okay, or Mm -hmm. their intuition is saying like, no, you can't trust this person is really just their emotional feeling hurt rather than actually that this person isn't trustworthy. So I just want to say, take it with a grain of salt. Haven't we talked about like a gut feeling being a real thing on this show, though? Well, I okay, that so we've spoken I about that. like I was going to mm-hmm. argue that a little bit because I don't, I wouldn't want to say like intuition is not a real thing. Like mm-hmm. I think intuition is a thing that people feel. I think where it starts to get sticky is the fact that it can be very easily misinterpreted and misconstrued with many other things. I guess that's like more what I mean. Like the particular emotions you're feeling in that moment or getting construed with your values of what you think that you should be doing versus what you're actually doing. Um, I think it's that. I think it is a thing. Like I think people can have like gut checks, you know, um, mm-hmm. people can have that voice in their head that's telling them not to do something. Um, how much weight you give it, I think, needs to really heavily depend on the context that's my opinion Mm -hmm. well people can also lie to themselves and say like you know this relationship is so hard but i feel like he's the one so i'm gonna stick with it or whatever and and that's what i'm getting at is is not to say i get get you is not to say ignore your gut ignore your intuition but to know that that in itself is not a good enough reason for anything it's not a good enough reason to be in a relationship. It's not a good enough reason to say that you could never be in a relationship with someone or have a certain type of relationship, whatever. Those things still might be true, but intuition's not the only, like, it's not, I think people tend to think of intuition as being this voice that's always correct mm-hmm. and that we just mm-hmm. are either paying attention to it or not. And that's that's the part that I want to argue is to say, no, listen to it, see what's going on there. And then also try to look at it logically and be like, do I have evidence to back this up? Does it make sense? And if both those things line up, once you start looking at it, then you'll have a better idea that this is a decision I can make confidently. Mm. Yeah. So well, can we talk about honesty? Let's Can let's we talk do about... It. Yeah. Yeah. So I think definitely if you're more honest with yourself, then that gives you the opportunity to be more honest with your partner. Mm. Um, because... A lot of times, like we said before, if uh, you tend to not tell someone for a long time about something that you've been dishonest about or like a breach of trust, then more damage can be caused if you just tend to like not speak about it for a very long amount of time. Yeah. So I'd say, yeah, work towards talking about things just as soon as you become aware of them. And another thing, something that we talk about a lot on this show is our radar or another monthly check-in, um, which is a great way to do this without needing to find like a time, a specific time to derail your day or just like, shit, I've got to talk to you about something right now. Instead, maybe talk about it in your monthly radar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it seems like if you are on this path of, okay, I need to create trust, I need to rebuild trust, it seems like that's the first step out the gate is... If there's something you need to come clean about, ideally that happens sooner rather than later. Later, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and also I, I think this is worth thinking about as you're starting any kind of new relationship as well, um, or in that process of rebuilding trust, where it's kind of like you're having to start over from square one in terms of building that trust. Is is that is is taking that time to be honest with yourself so that you can be more honest with your partner or your friend or you know whoever this is. I think that that one thing that's really helpful about having the monthly meeting or some kind of a of a regular check in that's not like hey we need to have a meeting because I need to talk about this. It's just like we have it. We're going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Is that sometimes it's hard to know like. If I think about you know my experience in monogamous relationships in the past, and definitely something I've heard from other people, is it's like, well, maybe I might feel some attraction toward other people, but at what point is that a big enough thing that I actually need to talk about it? Because mm-hmm. I know that's going to be uncomfortable. And again, if it's something that has to get brought up out of nowhere, even if for you it is just like, hey, I have these feelings or these attractions toward this friend of ours or this coworker or something that if it's brought up, like we need to talk about something and then you bring that up, your partner might think, Oh gosh, this is a really big deal that they need to act on right now. And for you, that might not be true. Whereas having something that's sort of a pre-scheduled meeting where you're already in the habit of sharing your thoughts with each other and just updating on where you are right now is a good opportunity to be able to bring those up. It's not necessarily going to be comfortable, Mm -hmm. but by getting really honest and some people even take this so far as to to argue for radical honesty mm. which is where you're mm. honest about everything no matter how, how uncomfortable damaging or, or hurtful it might be yeah or how yeah. hurtful it might be i think mm. there's a balance to be found there mm-hmm. um but anyway just i just wanted to bring that up that that sometimes it's hard to know like when is something big enough to be worth talking about like mm. when is it real enough and i think that having some kind of a regular way to check in is a good way to mm-hmm. to sort of lessen the barrier to talking about things. Okay, okay yeah, so so far to, safe space. to recap a little bit on this journey of rebuilding trust, uh-huh. you know, we have like, you know, coming clean about things sooner rather than later, establishing uh, open channels of communication or regular channels of communication in order to be able to talk about these things. Um, and I think part of this is also having realistic expectations for what that restored trust is is going to look like or could potentially look like Um, because like i was saying earlier um unfortunately like we can never get back to perfect trust in our lives we can never get back to to that that baby baby, that baby Baby trust trust. (laughs) (laughs) you know um and that's not necessarily a bad thing it's just a fact that's just a part of growing up that's a part of us figuring out how the world works that's a part of us figuring out how human beings work um and the same thing in our relationships is that it's if trust has been betrayed either on a small level or on a grander level, it's unlikely that you're ever going to be able to return to that same level of trust that you were beforehand. You may be able to return to something similar, um, Mm -hmm. but it may not be exactly the same. And so again, Dr. Ricky Robbins uh, distinguishes kind of these different kinds of restored trust. Um, The first one that's here is guarded trust. So as in you may be thinking, I will trust you again, but I'm going to be on guard for another betrayal because if it happened once, it could happen again. And Mm -hmm. again, this whole guarded trust thing, it can manifest in varying degrees, right? You know, at the extreme end, it could be um, that you are on guard all the time for another betrayal and you trust your partner, but you're um, you know, you're constantly looking out for any evidence that this betrayal might happen again Mm -hmm. versus on the other end of the extreme of... um, you know, largely you trust your partner, but maybe in the back of your mind, you still have that memory of like, right, this did happen once. um, And maybe you don't put a lot of stock into it happening again or whatever, but that is still there in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's another one uh, that I think is a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to like, be like, yeah, this is a good thing, but Mm -hmm. it's conditional trust. So it's like, if, I'll trust you again under certain conditions. So if you like never communicate with the accomplice again, like mm-hmm. if you cheated on someone or if you cheated with someone, um, then that person will trust you, your your spouse or whomever will trust you again if you never speak to the person who you cheated with mm-hmm. ever again. And yeah. then I'll trust you. This one, this was another one that I, I'm not sure about because it feels mm-hmm. like I understand it, it but well, but I also see it having the potential of being kind of toxic. 
you know, exactly. in certain circumstances. Mm-hmm. Well, although, if I can, just to be devil's advocate mm-hmm. here, if I was going to yeah. argue for this, I would say the important distinction is that this is about the condition of not continuing to do something that was involved with the violation of trust. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we see more often in talking with people that's a more toxic version of this is, I'll trust you, but only if you don't communicate with anyone who I'm uncomfortable with. That's Mm -hmm. a little bit different. Whereas this is limited to specifically, at least in this example here, right? Mm -hmm. That this is limited to specifically the person you know, that you collaborated with to mm, do whatever this accomplice. breach of trust. So I think that's at least worth looking at, that that, to me, makes a bit of a difference, Yeah, at least. that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Uh, and then the last of these three types here is called selective trust. And this is kind of a, a combination of the other two almost, but it's like, I'll trust you in this one area, but not in another area. So this could be something like, you know, I'm going to trust you to raise our kids together, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to trust you with money anymore and we're going to separate our finances. Hmm. Or, right, or I'm not going to trust you anymore with sexual fidelity if it was a monogamous relationship and saying, well, okay, that's a boundary for me, so we're not going to be in that kind of relationship anymore, even though we may still live together, we may still raise our kids together, maybe we do still share a bank account or a business or whatever it is, that it's selective trust, that you choose to trust in certain areas and not others. Hmm. Um, this one makes me think a little bit about the confidence that we talked about earlier, too. Right. Mm. If, it, that does seem like it could be related to this. Especially when it comes to to money or raising children or something where it's like, Maybe I just think you can't do this good, <laughs> so well, I'm not going mean, to trust could be you in that where it's area. Like, I'm going to like I'm going to trust you to get this report done, but I'm not going to ask you to have it by a specific date because mm. I don't think you have the ability or the competence to get things in on time. Oh, that's an interesting. And so example, maybe like yeah. that makes me choose what kind of tasks I want to delegate to you. Mm-hmm. Like maybe I can trust you with tasks that are not time sensitive because I know you are competent in that arena, but not in the arena of working under a deadline, for instance. Yeah. And this is a decent segue into uh, something, and this comes from uh, David Bedrick, who's a a counselor, educator, author, and an attorney who talks about the ways that betrayal is inevitable. That sometimes it's as simple as one person agreeing to be a certain kind of partner, and then later mm. learning that they can't be that. Mm. So, for example, it what could, does that mean? Yeah. Well, it could be something. I think we see that all the time. Yeah. I see it all the time with people who got married monogamously twenty mm. years ago, and yep. at that time, that was the partner they wanted to be. That was the kind of relationship they wanted mm. to have. Yeah. Um, like they weren't lying with their vows or, or right. lying about their love for that person. And then twenty years later, they realize, oh, actually, I think I might my values and my feelings might align more with non-monogamy um and either we can explore that together or the sad fact is just that like i can't be the same partner as i was 20 years ago and it's sad to label that as a betrayal that sounds dramatic to label it as a betrayal but that is you know that is just it's like that breach of trust you know Mm -hmm. and that doesn't come out of necessarily someone wanting to be mean or or wanting to specifically be cruel be, yeah. exactly it's just kind of out of these particular circumstances yeah one of the examples that uh that he gives is if you start off a relationship with the understanding that one of us is going to be the breadwinner and the other is going to be a homemaker that you might for be a hundred percent that's what we want that's what we're promising to each other all of that and then maybe 10 years later you realize i'm really unhappy working this job when i would like to be pursuing my creative passions instead right Mm -hmm. or or vice versa it could be the person at home realizing you know i'm actually not happy only doing this i want to be i want to feel like i'm making some kind of contribution in the world and that's not that they lied before Mm. but it's that we do change so that's just just one example um but he goes on to say that you know we all also have this, you know, the shadow self, if we want to be Jungian about it, uh, but, <laughs> you know, qualities or needs or capacities that we don't even know about yet, right. that haven't become clear to ourselves yet, and that we can't control our own of that, and we can't control that in other people. And if we try to, that's, first of all, it's just going to fail. And second of all, it's going to end up being 
suppressive, it's going to lead to kind of an explosion of these qualities, or more likely in term, in, into like a real betrayal of trust, like mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. on this. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also an interesting way of looking at it, of saying it kind of goes along with realizing you can have guarded or conditional or selective trust. I think this is especially useful if you're someone who because of experiences in your life has a harder time trusting is mm -hmm. to realize like, okay, if I start from the assumption that that perfect trust isn't a thing, like that that's not the goal. And so if I don't have that, it doesn't mean I'm failing. Mm -hmm. But instead mm -hmm. it's like, I'm gonna try to figure out who's worth giving trust to and then give them as much as I'm able to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think that that again from a lot of the examples of specific cases that I read about in in researching this is a lot of how people have learned to recover and be able to have other rewarding relationships after a really bad betrayal or infidelity or something like that is it does kind of take this step of I'm going to start giving some trust to people a little bit at a time like mm -hmm. as I can like mm -hmm. whenever I feel like you know, it's like over here I can't trust and over here I can and maybe what I can is very small, like very small, very few categories or very few people. But there's this little gray area in the middle where I'm not so sure. It's like pushing that little gray area mm -hmm. just a little bit more toward giving a little bit more trust mm -hmm. um, as a way of as a way of getting back some of that well-being like we were talking about earlier with that correlation. Right. Well, I feel like we're ending up giving the same disclaimer that we give in so many episodes, <laughs> uh -huh. which is that if you're being abused, if someone is being violent to you, if there's repeated betrayals of trust, mm -hmm. even if it's small damages to trust, but they're repeating over time constantly, um, it is okay and encouraged to leave that relationship yes. um, mm -hmm. as quickly and as safely as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, uh, you should never feel obligated to trust someone that right. you just don't or that you just feel yeah. like you can't. Um, however, if you're in a relationship and there's been some kind of violation, either large or small, and the two of you have decided to rebuild trust, um, you know, it can help to come to it with the understanding that uh, you just, you both will betray each other's trust at times. Mm -hmm. You will. Ideally, it won't be a systemic thing. It won't be a repeating thing, but you will. It can be a breach of an agreement. It can be a misunderstanding where someone accidentally, like unintentionally gets their feelings hurt. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing to take away from this is the fact that you can work together. You can come to it from this mutual understanding. Um, and uh, I wanted to end it off with something really strong, but now I'm rambling. Well, just that if you can both come together and realize like the process of rebuilding this trust can be the thing that makes us stronger and better mm. rather yeah, than it's being a mutual like, process. It's not just one person trying to do all the work. It's two people working together. I remember what I was going to say, <laughs> but yeah. it, was what, to, it, was, what? It, it was to reiterate that at the end of the day, like there is no relationship that will feel 100% safe. Mm. And that's, mm. I mean, it's I, safe that, enough. That's, yeah, exactly. It's kind of a scary thing to say, but it's like really, you know, as we pointed out early on, it's like, you know, betrayals are inevitable even when they're on a tiny scale. And so you may never feel absolutely 100% safe and like I never have to worry about anything in a relationship. Um, and honestly, if you did, it would probably be pretty boring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just bear that in mind. Like your re relationship should feel safe to you but they may never feel like there's no way anything can possibly go wrong because that's just the nature of human relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you understand that too, again, if you are rebuilding trust, understanding that it can take a lot of time. Like I said, it, it takes a lot longer to build trust than it does to damage it or to break it. Mm -hmm. But to understand that if you're willing to do that and really improve your honesty with yourself your honesty with each other and improve your communication through that process that understanding that it's not like it could have been possible for us to have a perfect kind of trust in our relationship and now we're just going to go for like second best that it's just that's always going to happen there is no mm -hmm. such thing as perfect trust and so this might actually be an opportunity for us to end up stronger than we were originally mm, right and i think that's 
worth remembering mm. that this yeah. isn't this isn't just like we're going to get by now as much as we can and even though it may take time and feel discouraging that you can actually get to a place that is i think stronger and has more of a firm foundation against future challenges than you could have and i'm speaking about this from my own personal experience as well as what i've seen with other people and mm -hmm. and what i've read about in researching this topic yeah yeah oh well, great let's take it home sweet all right if you have a question or a comment that you would like to be played on our show you can call our number six seven eight m u l t i zero five and leave us a voicemail or you can send us an audio message at the multi-amory facebook page you can also email us at info at multi .com or send us a message on twitter facebook or instagram to support our show and join our private facebook community go to patreon.com slash multi amory multi amory is created and produced by emily matlack dedeker winston and me jace lindgren our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. I'm Tina Horn, author of Love Not Given Lightly and host of the Wire People Into That podcast. And you're listening to a Swing Set podcast at swingset.fm.